Hello everyone! The wait is finally over. This video took a really long time for me to make, and I have had to have help from multiple creators, and I would like to thank them for helping me out. This is the lore of the world of Sinus Romanum. Sinus Romanum is based around the question, what if Europe remained Latinized? Meaning, basically, what if Latin influence, culture, and linguistics remained dominant in Europe and the Mediterranean? While this might sound simple at first, in actuality, there are multiple points of divergence that would still end up in a deed of Latinized Europe. So for this scenario, I had to make two points of divergence, no Christianity and no crisis of the third century. So with that being said, let's start at the beginning. In 75 BC, the Hasmonean Civil War does not occur. How this happens is a decrease in tension between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, with the Pharisees not objecting to the king about his religious rights like in our timeline, but instead these factions unite on national solidarity and disagreeing only in doctrine, not governmentally. As well, the disputes between the two heirs of the throne do not occur, with one of them dying due to disease, thus keeping Hasmone and Judea as a strong and stable state. Eventually, due to the Parthians and other threats such as the Nabataeans, Judea applied for a protectorship under the Roman Republic, but this would be voluntary, and a strict contract was signed. Eventually, under Augustus, he would try to violate the said contract and incorporate Judea under the new Roman Empire. This caused severe outrage in Judea, as well as the Senate. While not holding any real power, the prestige and influence on public opinion was still there, and open rebellion occurred in Judea, and because the Pharisee and Sadducee factions were more united, Judea had a strong organized rebellion. The rebellion would last seven years, and it took a massive toll on the Roman army. With the increasing calls from the Senate and disapproving public opinion, along with wanting to maintain Judea because of its trade routes, Augustus would concede and establish a new constitution, with Judea being underneath the Roman control, with the Hasmonean king having complete control of the province domestically, with the only exception being a tax quota. Many Roman emperors would try to weaken this constitution later, but with similar results. Eventually, many realized the best way to maintain the province and good relationship with the Jews was to keep the constitution in place. With this, Jews remained loyal to Rome just like in the past with other empires. And because of this, since the Jews are not oppressed, the societal pressure needed to create a messiah is not there. Therefore, Christianity does not rise. <laughs> In order for the crisis of the 3rd century to not exist, you need to take away the conditions that allowed the crisis to occur in the first place. And so, for the crisis of the 3rd century not to happen, the Severans must not take power. The Severan dynasty caused the crisis to happen by bloating the army and increasingly debased the currency in order to pay for it. The reason why this happened in the first place was because Septimius Severus was an equestrian, the first to become an emperor. This meant his legitimacy was the most shaky out of all emperors so far, and so, in order to prevent potential challengers, Septimius Severus engaged in the aforementioned practice. So, Septimius Severus is out, as well as his dynasty. Instead, the man who emerges victorious from the year of the five emperors is the one everyone thought he would, Piscinius Niger, who, despite being a novus homo, had actually attained the senatorial rank. Holding the Eastern Legions, he had the largest army out of all pretenders, and in normal circumstances, that would have been enough to win the Civil War. As an Emperor, he would essentially be a second Vespasian. His reign would be challenged by usurpers, much like Vespasian, but his rebellions would end up being put down. He would eventually die and his children would take over, starting the Niger... N Nigerian? Let's go with Nigerian. Nigerian Dynasty, which would focus on maintaining the budget balance, though increasingly larger barbarian invasions would thwart these goals from time to time and force the Roman emperors to increase the army size and debase the currency, though not anywhere near to the same crippling extent as it happened in our own timeline. The Nigerian dynasty would eventually come to an end, but unlike the Severans, rather than bringing a crisis that would nearly end the Roman Empire, it would simply be business as usual, with the Senate picking another Nerva, which would then give rise to a new dynasty. Another event which is subtle but would help this Roman Empire be far more stable than the one in our own timeline is the fact that in this world, the climate did not engage in wild shifts for 300 years. Rather, it simply gradually became colder at a fairly stable rate. As well, the Hunnic Empire did not conquer and raid much of the Ukrainian steppe and Roman Empire. 
Instead, it was defeated early on by the Alans, which would later come to be a major empire in the steppe, in the 400s. Without the Hunnic Empire, much of the nomadic tribes aren't pushed west towards Rome. Considering how the Alans weren't as barbarous and violent as the Huns, they don't push tribes towards Rome, along with establishing an alliance with Rome by extorting Parthia for payment along with the loot from said reds being kept. With this alliance, trade would also begin with the Romans from Crimea. During this time, the Alans would become prosperous, well, as prosperous as a bunch of tribes could be. Along with the deal with Rome, the Alans would not settle in Europe, but remain in the steppe. This has the effect of stopping, or at least diminishing the effects of the Age of Migration. Various Germanic, Slavic and Uralic peoples moved into Europe basically rewriting the ethnic map, removing many peoples of Latin influence. This removal of migration is key towards a larger Latinized Europe. By avoiding the Civil War and the Age of Migration, Rome would remain prosperous for another 200 years and their culture would reflect on their prosperity, with Roman culture remaining the way it had for centuries. Eventually, this prosperity would end with the Roman Emperor Anastasius dying in 518. This causes a massive quarrel between the generals of Anastasius, which ultimately caused a massive civil war. With the civil war occurring, barbarian tribes begin raiding more, and with this, Rome begins deteriorating. With the civil war occurring, the Greek side of the empire decides to separate from Rome and become independent, forming the Empire of Hellas. The civil war would end in 536, and Western Rome lasts longer than it did in our timeline. Because the Vandals remain in Germany, so they can't take away Rome's food supply in North Africa. With this, Rome lasts another hundred years, until 645 where the Great African Rebellion occurs, with the formed African Empire defeating Rome in 654. With this defeat, Rome would collapse under its own weight, and in 656, the Empire would die. Without Christianity, a new religion would arise to fill its niche. So, I figured no better person would be able to discuss this religion than Christian historian. Oh boy, is he going to love this. I hate this. Anyways, the niche filler for Christianity in this mod is Mithraism. It's also known as Catoism for reasons we'll get into later. Mithraism is the world's largest religion, covering most of Europe, Oceania, North and West Africa, North America, and chunks of the Middle East and South America. The religion originated in the late 4th century when a man by the name of Cato Illyrius began spreading his teachings as a prophet. Cato was born in 391 in the Roman colony of Judea to a Roman representative. He was raised as many Judean nobles were to be a devout member of the Jewish faith. However, after his entrance into Judaism, he began exploring his region's other cultures and came into contact with the Mithras cult. A very brief summary of the syntax. Sedexia? Listen, this is the word that Chicken made up to call the followers of Mithras. How am I supposed to pronounce that? From here on out, I'm just going to call him Sids. Anyways, the crazy hodgepodge of religions is monotheistic. The Sids believe in a god known as Mithras, who is kind of similar to the Abrahamic god. They believe the best way to serve Mithras is through good deeds, respect for yourself and neighbor, and uniquely, devotion to one's nation. Okay, okay, back to Cato. Cato comes in contact with this cult and falls in love with their beliefs, but is disgusted at the current state of the religion. Cato begins furiously protesting against the leaders of the cult for years. He did this until he received a vision from Mithras stating that he was the prophesied messenger of the faith. Many had claimed this title before, but failed the three tests the prophet has to endure as decreed by the holy book of the cult, the Ante Aperito, which we'll touch on a bit later. Anyways, Cato offers himself to be tested. However, due to his test being done by the same people he had spent years pronouncing his disdain for, they made his test more suicidal. Miraculously, Cato passed with flying colors and was proclaimed the holy messenger of the faith. He reorganized the faith into its intended state, and it soon spread like wildfire across the Roman Empire. Moving on to the Mithraistic belief system, as previously stated, Mithraism shares many core beliefs with other monotheistic faiths like Zoroastrianism and Judaism. These similarities include promoting good deeds, belief in heaven, devotion to one true God, disdain for other pagan beliefs, etc. However, they do have a few deviations. Notably, they do not forbid homosexuality, just homosexual marriage. The most important part of their beliefs, however, is their fear of a satanic horde known as the Tenebris. The antithesis to Mithras, they thrive on hatred and chaos. The Tenebris is not one being, but many, a swarm of demons which all act as one like a hive mind. Notably, the Sids usually represent Tenebris by a raging bull. The Sids believe the Tenebris is responsible for all of man's pitfalls and sinful desires. 
To mitigate chaos and thus the strengthening of Tenebris, Cato decreed that devotion to one's nation is most important. A unified cause to maintain peace in your region can thwart the Tenebris. One last important note is that Cato is not seen as a divine figure like Jesus is seen in Christianity. Cato is simply a holy messenger blessed by their God to lead the religion, like Moses in the Bible or Muhammad in Islam. Similar to Christianity, Mithraism has its fair share of denominations, which are usually based on regional lines. However, these denominations did not come about by some dude airing his grievances on a door, but more how orthodoxy and Catholicism split, through doctrinal differences, mainly different interpretations of Mithras and Cato's work. The first and largest denomination are the Patrists. Formed after dispute of their holy book was raised after Cato's death, they dominate most of Europe, the Caribbean, and parts of Africa. The notable difference between them and other denominations are their acceptance of parts of the holy book and their willingness to idolize Cato through art and statues. Next up are the Bonorums. Bonorums are spread between North and West Africa, the American West Coast, and Eastern South America. They differ with the Patriots through outlawing idolization and their belief that ethnic homogeneity is the best way to reduce the authority of the Tenebris, thus being more conservative in general compared to the Patriots. Next are the Pantheonics. Concentrated in Greece, Anatolia, the Levant, Egypt, and pockets of Africa and South America, the Pantheonics have similar core beliefs to the Patrist. However, they differ majorly by believing that Mithras is truly the Greek pantheon of gods, unified into one entity. Thus, completely disregard the Abrahamic creation story detailed in the Ante Aperito. Next, the Julianists, focused in Indonesia, Australia, and Vespucia. These Samoan Nazis believe that rebelling against a Mithras nation is heresy. Julianists have similar beliefs to the Orthodox Benorums, with them also having strict views on ethnicity and culture, but turn the intensity up to 11, and pretty much demand totalitarian theocracies everywhere, which sounds pretty base to me. Anyways, those were the four main denominations now under this cuckoo religion's holy book. Mithraism's holy book is called the Magna Scripta. It's basically if the Bible condensed its chapters and hooked up with Zoroastrian teachings after a drunken night out. It's split into two parts, the Ante Aperito, which is basically the Old Testament. It was written before Cato, back when the religion was still a cult. Like the Christian Old Testament, it outlines the basic foundations and rules of the religion and the key stories. The second part is the Exim Aperito, the equivalent to the New Testament of the Magna Scriptum. It details Cato's life and teachings. There is also the Book of Abraham, which isn't accepted by all Sids. It's essentially the Jewish Torah slithered into the Ante Aperita. As far as their reaction to non-believers, they will burn you at a stake, drown you, behead you, stone you, toss you in a sinkhole, feed you to wild animals, and much, much more if you don't fall on your knees to the glories of Mithras. Such an imposing presence has forced other religions to become more centralized. This is seen in the case of Zoroastrianism, which became much more organized and radical. The coolest part of this transformation is that the high priest of Zoroaster has a legion of crusaders with flamethrowers. This is also seen in Odinism. Caused by the growing threat Mithraism posed to their south, the pagan Norse religion evolved into a true centralized religion. They developed a hierarchy of shamans, mandated temples and shrines, created a capital of the religion, and converted the oral legends and runic tablets into a written book. Odinism is found in the historic areas that Nordic culture was, which puts them mainly at odds with northern patriots who they frequently have conflict with. Solana Folkism, the religion of Gothia, believes that the Gothic royal family is literally descendants of the sun. Like the Zoroastrians, they have quite a thing with fire. So yeah, that's all. Anyways, this has been a very brief summary of the nine-page essay on Mithraism Chicken Simi. You guys should totally check out my channel though. I plan on making a lot more videos now that I have a new computer. Since my last one got crushed by a tree. Anyways, God bless all. Back to you, you yellow feather troll. Due to the Dark Age not occurring, mostly due to increased infrastructure, technology is farther ahead than it is in our timeline. However, now due to the Roman Empire collapsing, the Dark Ages still do occur. Kind of. But unlike our timeline, it is more isolated due to the African, or Punic, and Hellen empires, isolating the collapse of society to Italia, Gaul, and Albion. The African Empire would become a dominant power in the Western Mediterranean, establishing a rivalry with Hellas. Along with the rise of the African Empire, the Goths settle in what is Hungary in our timeline, and they become heavily influenced by the Illyrian tribes, 
and they begin to distance themselves away from the rest of Germania. With this, the Goths expand over much of continental Europe. In 1056, the Empire of Hellas was invaded by the Persians. The invasion was successful due to civil conflict and African involvement, who wanted to expand their influence across the Mediterranean. With this conflict, much of the Hellas Empire was cut off, including the Jews, Egyptians, Cyrenians, and Phoenicians. With the Greeks invaded by the Persians, a puppet Greek government was set up, which lasted for nearly 200 years. However, this would end during the Mongol invasions, which occurred just like in our timeline. Once the Mongols collapsed, Europe was changed. Many nations of Europe and Libya had the opportunity to reestablish themselves on the continent, such as the Vos Venators, who are this timeline's Russians. This also includes the Hellens, with them gaining their independence and recapturing their Mediterranean influence from Africa and forcing Africa to reform into Punicia. At this time, Italy was recovering from the Dark Ages. Genoa was a major port city, and during the Mongol invasion, they took the opportunity and began expanding rapidly into the Italian peninsula. But they were soon challenged by Gaul, which did not want to have another Italian state invade them. The Genoan, General Aureus Caffiniar, was able to hold the Gaulians back. Due to this defeat, the Gaulians gave up on their invasion, and Genoa took over the entire Italian peninsula. With this, the king relocated his capital to Rome and established the Kingdom of Italia. With the establishment of the Kingdom of Italia, many powers of the world began to fear their rise due to the trauma of the Roman Empire. So powers like Hellas, Punicia, and others blockaded Italia from the Silk Road. Due to this, the King of Italia ordered the explorer Lanzero Macarius to find a new route to India through the Atlantic. Using the Italian held port cities in Hispania, Marcolius launched from the port of Gades in Hispania. Little did he know he would find a new world. After Meroclius launched from Gades, he would land in what is now known as the Caribbean island of Hispania in 1319. Thinking he had found a passage to India, he would found the colony of Transatlantiqua. However, later it would be found that this landmass was not India, but rather a new continent, taking on the name of its foundational colony. With the discovery of this new continent, the Italians began sending expeditions to Central America, eventually bringing the Italians into conflict with the Mexica Confederation. The arrival of the Italians allowed many cities to gain leverage over the smaller states, forcing them to form a confederation. Unlike our timeline, the natives do not die due to European diseases, because in the early 10th century, a Punic trader ship crashed in Transatlanticum and introduced European diseases across the Terra Novan continents ahead of time. While it did kill off a large portion of the native population, they recovered within 100 years. The conflict with the Italians would end in Mexica victory, and the Mexica repelling the Italians and establishing their own empire. With this defeat, the Italians would remain focused on the Caribbean, known as Nova Mediterraneum, along with the landmass north of it that would come to be known as Hesperia. These colonization attempts would be successful, attracting Italian settlers and allowing Nova Mediterranean to become highly populated. Along with attracting Italian settlers, it would attract other powers such as the Punics, who would settle in the lower continent that would be known as Trans-Australia, the Lusitanians who would settle in Chicaba Albion in the New England area, the Norse in Vinland, and the Hellas who would settle in what is now Guyana. However, back in Europe, tension was rising due to colonial disputes. Rising Italian dominance in the New World was leading many European powers including Gaul, Punica, and Hellas to attack Italia. It looked like Italia was doomed, that is, until Callistus Bronte arrived on the scene. Castilius Bronte was born into a Greek noble family in the Kingdom of Italia. From a very young age, he was shown to be a competent strategist and warrior. When he was 16, he enrolled in the Military Academy of Rome. At 21, he graduated and immediately became a top military commander. When Italia was invaded in 1452 by the coalition, many Italian generals were being pushed back, but Castilius was pushing forward. He quickly conquered parts of southern Gaul and Hispania. This made him extremely popular among the people, and he decided to do something called a pro-gamer move. He took a fleet out and sacked Athens. This weakened the Hellas Empire and made him extremely popular among the Italian people. He used this popularity to overthrow the king in claiming he had a vision from Mithras and that he was sent to reestablish an Italian dominion over the world, and so he renamed himself Theodoran. His overthrow was very successful, and he proclaimed himself the emperor of all the Latins. With himself in control, he was able to begin to take the reins of Italia and turn the tables on the powers that invaded him. 
He began a campaign taking the Strait of Gibraltar, cutting off Penician and Helen's supply lines to their respected colonies. He then began an attack on both Athens and Carthage to strike at the cultural heartland of both. Athens quickly fell and Theodoran quickly moved in troops and invaded Thrace as well as Anatolia. While Athens fell easily, Carthage did not, and instead it stayed resistant for two whole years. Due to this, Theodoran tried another strategy to instead invade through the Levant and North Afratera and meet up with his army in the siege. After he conquered Anatolia, the Hellas Empire surrendered in which he moved through the Levant and Egypt with little resistance. And once he finally made it to the Penician border, he was met with heavy resistance, but in less than a year's time, he had made it to Carthage. However, the Punic royal family fled to Trans-Australia, where they established the kingdom of Bolemicaria. With the royal family gone, the defenders of Carthage surrendered, and all of Penicia came underneath Theodoran's control. The Glorious War, as it became known as, lasted from 1452 to 1459, and gave rise to the Latin Empire. In order to keep his empire together, Theodoran organized the empire into a federation, each with its different kings ruling each of their kingdoms, but with one emperor ruling them all. The Empire of Theodoran would be a successor of the Roman Empire, and it would last over a hundred years. <laughs> While all that was going on in the Mediterranean, in Eastern Asia, a few things that were a little sussy were occurring, but I'm going to let the China boy, Josh Sullivan, cover that. Hey yo, what's up dudes? It's me, Josh, from Josh Sullivan History. Now, oh come on! I do one video about China, and now I'm just our designated China guy? Sure, fine, whatever, let's just get this over with. So, what is going on in China and Sinus Romanum? Well, to say the least, a lot. So, first of all, because trade over to Europe along the Silk Road is halted, this extremely cripples China, so it ends up taking them a lot longer to recover from the Mongol invasions. And speaking of the Mongols, China ending up crippled would allow them to regroup and so the Northern Yuan Dynasty would be able to conquer pretty much all of Siberia. Now, I already know what you're wondering. Why the hell would they want Siberia? It's just a bunch of empty snowy wasteland with only maybe a gulag or two. But there is a method to their madness. See, conquering Siberia would allow the Mongols to not only corner the fur trade, but would also give them extra protection from the expansionist Vozvenotars. What the heck do you pronounce that? Who cares anyways? And the next question to answer is, how did they manage to conquer all that snowy wasteland? The answer? Killing Seregs. Why is everything here so stupid to pronounce? Killing Seregs are basically trained cavalrymen and survivalists. They managed to bribe and conquer the tribes that existed in Siberia at the time, so that meant that the Mongols would end up having control over a hell of a lot of frozen wasteland. As the Mongols were conquering Siberia, they ended up having their first contact with the Vozvenotars, who are basically just wannabe Russians. However, as is typical for the Mongols, they immediately started having a bunch of skirmishes. The Mongols then decided to send a diplomatic mission to Kiev to try to help resolve the issue going on at their border, but this only ended up making the Mongols have to pay a bunch of reparations to the Vozvenotian government. So, even though their conquest of Siberia was technically successful, it ended up being stupid expensive, and they didn't even get to conquer the whole thing. So, how did the conquest of Siberia manage to benefit the Mongols? Well, since the Mongols were now able to corner the Siberian fur trade, this would end up boosting their economy a ton. They were also able to gain more control over the Pacific coast, so this would boost their economy even more. All of this economic boosting made the Northern Yuan Dynasty economically dominant, which would help defend itself from any Chinese attacks, ultimately making them an equal to China. However, the Mongols' new status as an equal to China would have its drawbacks too. Just like the dynastic cycle in China, the Mongols would start having periods of unity and disunity, in which different groups would come to take over the country for a while, before they ended up collapsing to revolt. 
though despite this, an intense rivalry would form between the Mongols and the Chinese, similarly to the French and the British in our timeline, leading to many wars between the two. Oh, and the Manchurian Yurchins were able to take control of Korea, so that too, I guess. So, overall, because of the halting of trade along the Silk Road, China ended up falling behind to the Mongols, who were now able to conquer a huge amount of land and become the economically dominant power of the Far East. This meant that what was once one united China was now two equal empires constantly fighting for dominance. And the Yurchins were there too, I guess. So, this has been Josh. If you'd like, go check out my channel, Josh Sullivan History, and maybe subscribe or something. Well, back to you, chicken man. See ya. While the rest of Europa fell to the Latin Empire, Gaul continued to resist. Gaul was extremely wealthy before the Glorious War. While during much of its history, Gaul was extremely poor, due to the fall of the African Empire, Gaul was able to get into trade in the Mediterranean. Due to heavy resistance thanks to their former wealth, guerrilla warfare, and a never give up attitude, they were able to weaken the Latins enough to not be able to conquer Gaul. Because of this, the Latin Empire was not able to expand outside of its Mediterranean domain into places like Germania, Albion, and Belgica. In 1486, at 69 years old, Theodorin would die to dysentery, and his son, Theodorin II, would take charge of the empire, and the empire would stay under relative peace for the next century. One thing Theodorin II did want to conquer, though, was Belemnicaria, which was where the surviving royal family of Penincia was exiled. In 1492, he sent a task force to take the city of Nova Carthage. However, the Belemnicarians defeated the city fiercely and were able to repel the task force. This marked the Belemnicarians' independence and resistance to Latin influence. The Latin Empire would retain the status quo for the next couple decades, until 1537, where Theodore II dies without an heir, and so a secession crisis occurs between his two brothers, Julian and Thiago. While Julian was older, Thiago was able to establish himself as emperor because he was closer to Rome, while Julian was the governor of the northern Transatlanticum Colonae across the ocean. This causes Julian to form an army to Europa to take back the throne, in which he shipwrecks before he makes it so he decides to establish an independent kingdom on northern Transatlanticum, and he would call this new kingdom Hesperia. In retaliation, Thiago sends a fleet to capture the port of Nova Venetia, in which he fails. Because of this, Thiago recognized Hesperia's independence, and while the Latin Empire still has holdings in Transatlanticum, they shift their focus away from it into new continents, while Hesperia becomes the main power in the Terranovan continents. Due to losing Hesperia, the Latin Empire looks for new areas to colonize and profit off of. The Empire sent Americo Vespucci, a Latin merchant, to set sail and discover the new lands and trade in them. Can you speak English? Fuck you! He landed in Oceania and named the land Vespuccia. Soon enough, the Latin Empire decided to colonize and gain strongholds in Vespuccia. This was also a way for Thiago to gain the reputation he lost along with Hesperia. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, a new Mithraistic set, Julianism, forms. The reason this is important is because a theocratic state is centered around the sect, and a massive invasion occurs of Latin Vespuccia. After the secession crisis, the empire was thrown into chaos at home and in their colonies too. Soon enough, riots and talks of rebellions started from the internal kingdoms, but Thiago thought they were bluffing and neglected the internal state of the country. Due to this misjudgment, when the rebellion did happen, the Latin Empire was not ready for the chaos that ensued. Many nations seceded, cracking the empire, and Emperor Thiago's reign was over, and the new nations that came out of it will face the challenge of centralizing authority to their own state. With the fall of the Latin Empire in 1578, infrastructure collapsed, ushering in the Hundred Year Darkness. With the collapse of infrastructure, the life of the average citizen in Europa collapsed, and so did many other kingdoms in the former Latin areas. And this caused a steep decline occurring in technology in Italia, and a mass bubonic plague occurring in the 1660s. With the slowdown of technology and infrastructure, the Italian kingdom that came out of the Latin Empire fell into 
political instability and chaos, with different warlords fighting over provinces. And with this political instability and technological stagnation, the colonies overseas either collapsed or other nations took control of them, with the West African, Zanzibarian, Amazonian, Arabian, Eastern and Vespucian, Indian, and other colonies falling. This left Western Vespucia, Nova Mediterranean, and the Entoterum Afratella as the only remaining colonies. But due to the decreasing Italian support, they acted with more autonomy with only the title of Importero Colonnae showing its ties to Rome. This would end, however, in 1669 with the rise of Claudius Rovellius. A warlord himself, Claudius would abolish the warlord system after conquering most of the Italian states. Claudius was the warlord of the province of Milan, and after the hundreds of years of infighting, he reunited Italia and began the Rovellius dynasty and ended the Hundred Year Darkness. Claudius himself noticed what brought Italia to its knees, and it was infighting. So he rewrote the law, procedures, and governments of the kingdom into the Claudian Code, which abolished the warlord system, federalized the kingdom, established a clear line of secession, and allowed the people of the Italian peninsula to elect advisors to the king. And he created a Bill of Rights for Italians, but only Italians. While he was only considered a legator or deputy, he was the de facto ruler of Italia. However, once his son took the role of legator, he abolished the Bronte dynasty and established himself as Caesar. And with this, the age of the Italian Empire was formed. <laughs> After the Hundred Year Darkness and the introduction of the Claudian Code, many of the old hierarchical nobility economies and all oligarchical societies and markets were abolished, creating freer markets and creating the system that would be known as capitalism. This would kickstart the Industrial Revolution in 1710 and 1720, and a period known as the Il Suado or the Enlightenment would start. A major philosopher during this time was Jovius Locvus, who established the idea of the capitalist republic with a minimal government limited by constitution. This idea would later be known as liberalism, and it would influence the later Hellenic Revolution. In 1779, the Italian Empire would go to war against the Kingdom of Hellas over Egypt, which the Italians wanted an easier trade route to Italian Vespuccia and requested passage of Italian troops and its supplies, which the Hellens, who were in a personal union, with Egypt refused, causing a war. The Italians won with the Egyptians rebelling and subsequently being put under a Italian puppet monarchy. With the war lost and trade lost to the Italians in the Phoenician Republic, the monarchy went into debt, and similar to the French Revolution, the people rebelled. The revolution would result in a revolutionary victory in the establishment of the Union Hellas Civitas, or the Hellen Union, and the beginning of the spread of republicanism. Elsewhere in the world, European colonization was starting up, however, not as we know. Empires such as the Italian, Albionian, Phoenician, and Hellenic would colonize the African coast, trading with the people groups for natural resources. Unlike in our timeline, however, the powers would not conquer the area, but rather initiate proxy colonization, where the great power would support a native tribe to conquer a region and trade resources. This causes many states that were not present before to form, using western technology and resources to fight against each other. However, this had the worst side effect of mass ethnic cleansings occurring. During this time, many social reforms were occurring with the introduction of capitalism, but with these reforms there were grievances. These grievances would give rise to divital liberalism. Divital liberalism was first inspired by the Belgian philosopher Maximilien Robespierre, which proposed a society where the workers own the means of production, as well as capitalism and free markets are abolished. This also formed the idea of a communard society where wealth is shared between all parties. This idea was pursued especially by the young idealist Carlius Marxius who proposed a dictatorship of the plebeian class in order to establish a communard society. This idea, however, was rejected by Robespierre, instead preferring a republican government to transition into a communard society. <laughs> By the time of 1853, European geopolitics was divided into two main coalitions. The Pactum, being composed of the Hellas Union and the Italian Empire, and the Triumvirate, consisting of Gaul, Punicia, and Hispania. Tension had been rising between the two factions. However, in 1853, it hit a boiling point, where the King of Punicia was assassinated by Cyrenian radicals, possibly supported by Egypt who wanted to challenge Punicia's dominance in the area. 
Punicia demanded an investigation of the Egyptian government, but Egypt refused, so Punicia declared war, and because Italia and Greece were allies of Egypt, they joined in on the fighting, bringing in Gaul and Hispania on the side of Punicia. This would mark the beginning of the Great War, or known in Italia as the Great Triumph. Fighting immediately began between the Egyptians and the Punicians, with the Egyptians trying to move into Cyrencia but failing. Eventually, the Hellen reinforcements moved in and began to push into Cyrencia. Punicia pushed right back with encirclement tactics and nearly captured Cairo. And with this, Egyptian troops began to entrench themselves and defend the capital. Now, this is where it could possibly turn into a trench warfare scenario. But with the time ticking, the Hellens needed to move more troops because the expeditionary force they originally sent was too small to advance the Punicians. So they had to move their troops through the already heavily in Helen influenced Assyria and neutral Judea, which they had to twist Judea's arm to join the Pactum. But before they could, the Punicians launched a massive and brutal assault that killed tens of thousands. And with that, the precedent of the war was set to massive offensives instead of trench warfare like in our timeline. With the capital fallen, the Egyptian army and the government nearly collapsed, with the king abdicating and a provisional government established. With this, Penicia sent a massive invasion force into Judea. During this time, Italia was defending well against the other members of the Triumvirate, causing mass casualties between Hispania and Gaul, thus giving Italia an advantage. So they launched an invasion into Hispania, which they could not handle considering how unstable the Hispanian government was. And because they could not handle this, they had to drop out of the war, allowing the Italians part of their land, but most importantly, allowing access to their ports. With the surrender of the Hispanians, Italia launched a massive invasion into Gaul. However, this invasion was slow, and it bogged down the Italians greatly because of how hard the Gauls fought with scorched earth tactics. During this time, the Punicians were blowing through the Judean and Hellenic armies, with the Judean capital and historically significant city Jerusalem being captured. This causes high instability within the Judean populace. With this, the Punicians advance further. With the advance, the Hellens and Judean troops planned to meet in the fields of Megiddo, and when the Punician troops moved in, they thought it would be an easy victory, but what occurred was the hardest fought battle of the entire war and in the end the Judeans and Helens would come out on top this victory decimated the Punician army and they were pushed back all the way to Egypt after the recapture of Cairo in June 1856 the Eastern Pactum prepared for a mass invasion of Punicia which was launched later that year during this time the Italian invasion of Gaul wasn't going well and in order to help their ally in the east the Italians decided to send the exiled Carlius Marxius into Gaul to cause chaos within the government. When Carlius went into the capital of Gaul, he started a revolution, and he seceded, establishing the Union of Gaul. Many of Gaul's distinctive nationalities seceded after this revolution, so after establishing order and reviving Gaul's economy, Marxius would go on a conquering spree, establishing sister republics in Francia and Belgica, and for the next 30 years, Marxius would rule with an iron fist. With the relief from Gaul, the Italians focused all their efforts on the invasion of Punicia. With all resources gathered on December 10th, 1856, the Hellens and the Italians launched their invasions on Punicia. Punicia refused to surrender, but after a naval bombardment of Carthage, they signed an unconditional surrender. On December 23rd, 1856, the guns of the great powers lay silent. The Great War has ended. <laughs> With the loss of the Great War, Penicia felt humiliated and defeated, and the Republic was having trouble paying off the debt, meaning it had failed in the eyes of many. With that sense of failure, many Penicians saw it justifiable to overthrow the government, according to Bonaram Mithraism. And one group took this opportunity, the National Sumanio Confederacy, or the National Sumanist Confederacy. Sumanists, to put it lightly, are the fascists of this timeline, who are mostly united except for variations economically between corporatists, plebeians, and loyalists. In 1865, the Sumanists overthrew the government, and with this, the National Union State of Punicia was established, beginning a new age in Punicia. After the war, nationalism in Italia soared. However, the newfound nationalism didn't know what direction it would go. It is 1886. It is a fairly uncertain time in Italia, with Gaul and Punicia seeking to destroy Italia at any chance it gets. Although, even these rival nations have problems of their own. 
with Marxius being on their deathbed and Punicia being economically in the gutter. With all these problems, the odds are even, making it a classic standoff. The only question is, who will move first? Surprisingly, through the bloodshed and mass offensives of the Great War, the Italian monarchy's image was not tarnished, and Antony IV still sits on the throne with massive support. Most Italians hold him in high regard and look to him with an answer in this situation. The fate of Italia and the whole world is in his hands. It's in your hands. This is the lore of Sinus Romanum. This mod places you in control of the nations of the world. However, in a world far different from our own. If you would like to be updated on this mod, please visit the Discord link in the description. If you'd like to join our development team, please join it as well. The details are on the Discord on how you can join our team. Thank you.